In the mid-1850s, Hudson Taylor was a great missionary to the country of China. He and his colleagues sat with a group of Buddhist priests, having a quiet conversation, talking and talking some more, quietly visiting and getting acquainted. After some time, the Buddhist priest asked Missionary Taylor and his colleague, would you like to see our holy man? And they said, sure. So they they left their place where they were visiting. They climbed the stairs into the temple and then made their way down into the to the lower part of the, the temple, the, the basement or the dungeon or whatever, and went to this dark room that had over in one corner a stone wall with a small window opening. And the Buddhist priest led Hudson Taylor over and pointed and said, He is in there. Our holy man is in there. The whole village, all of the people around this area venerate this man. He, he is a very holy man. And the story is that Hudson Taylor and his colleague got up close to look to see if they could see the man. And inside was an old, emaciated, slowly deteriorating man who had blocked himself in this room and was going to live there until he died. And they would feed him a little bit through the, through the window. And all of the people around the area were happy that they had a holy man in their midst. Hudson Taylor tried to speak to this man of Jesus, a man who had never heard the name Jesus. And I've often wondered, what what did that man look like? A, A holy man. And then I've... Those thoughts took me even further to this whole idea of holiness and what is holiness. If we if we peep through the if we peep through the door of, of of the window of Scripture, what do we see there? Is it something mysterious and strange and odd and unknown? Or is it something that really can have an impact on us, on me, on you, on our world? As I have more in more recent more recent years come to better understand this this teaching, I have a growing appreciation for this for this doctrine that we call holiness. May I share with you some of the characteristics that I have begun to see as I've peeped through the window? And there are different characteristics in what I, as a teenager, used to assume holiness was all about. For example, the first characteristic, holiness, is Christ-centered. We see it in, in Paul's writing. He said, do not be selfish. This is actually a couple of verses before the one that, that President Smith read to us. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't think only about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they are doing. Your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. That he said in Philippians chapter 2. And then in the next chapter, this letter that he wrote to the Philippians, he, he gave his personal testimony. And a number of years ago, I was studying the book of Philippians, and this passage gripped me to the point I've not gotten away from it. As I've understood, Paul was saying, holiness is Christ-centered. Yes, everything else is worthless, Everything else is worthless when compared to the priceless gain of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. He didn't say anything about an experience, did he? He said, knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I may have Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own goodness or my ability to obey God's law, but I trust Christ to save me. Holiness is Christ-centered. And there's a statement that goes along with that. Experiencing the Holy Spirit leads to a primary focus on who? 
Christ. Let's read that sentence together. You've got it on the screen. Here we go. Experiencing the Holy Spirit leads to a primary focus on Christ. And that's the reality that I think we need to more fully understand. I think in the early days of the holiness movement, there was some mis- uh, some misinstruction going around, and the the emphasis began to be on an experience, an ecstatic experience that was unusual. Paul is saying, I want to know Christ. Jesus told the disciples in in, uh, John chapter 14 and also in John chapter uh, 15, both chapters, the same verse, 26. He said, when the Holy Spirit has come, when the other paraclete is come, he is going to teach you the things that he has heard me and my father talk about. And in chapter 15, he said, when the Holy Spirit has come, he is going to tell you about me. The real doctrine of holiness when, we, when we've come into an experience of the Holy Spirit, the focus, the spotlight is on Jesus Christ. Can our prayer be, O oh God, let me experience the Holy Spirit who will lead me to know Christ in His fullness? Can you pray that prayer with me? I'll, I'll repeat it. I'll say some phrases. Let's repeat it as a group. O oh God... Let me experience the Holy Spirit who will lead me to know Christ in His fullness. I trust that's our prayer. As we, as we look through the hole into this teaching, we need to see that Christ is the primary focus. There's a second characteristic. I call it dynamic. Not just Christ-centered, but dynamic. Initial cleansing enables constant growth. There's the statement. Can you say it with me? Initial cleansing enables continual growth. Paul Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 3. He said, When I think of the wisdom and the scope of God's plan, I fall on my knee and I pray to the Father the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will give you mighty inner strength through the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? You're aware that these, the, the recipients of this letter were Christian. They had come to Christ. In, the, in the, the book of Acts, it tells of the Holy Spirit falling on the believers there. And now Paul is saying, I pray that Christ will more and more be at home in your hearts as you trust in Him. There's a growth, initial cleansing that clarifies, that rectifies the wrong, that that cleanses the rebellion that's inside our heart, that corrects the bent to sinning, that that resolves that that inward turn toward our self-centeredness, initial cleansing, but then it sets us on a path for constant and continual growth. Paul said, may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And then that verse continues on and on. Could our prayer be, O Holy Spirit, cleanse me afresh today so that I might be a clean channel through which the love of Christ might flow. Can I be our prayer? May I invite us to collectively pray that prayer again? O Holy Spirit, cleanse me afresh today so that I may be a clean channel through which the love of Christ might flow. We're peeping into the window. What do you see there? a strange doctrine that, that we don't want to have anything about, we don't have anything to do with. No, I think we see something that is very inviting to us, something that's very necessary in our day. We see a teaching that, that, that brings us to a relational existence in our life. 
initial experience, the initial experience of holiness, the initial experience of sanctification opens the door for real relationship with God. There's the statement. Can we read it together? Initial experience opens the door for real relationship with God. I've been studying the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis recently. And I've been uh, particularly impressed with the three occasions that the the, uh, Pentateuch writer points out that God chose to walk with man. He walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Don't we wish we could have seen what that was like? A fellowship of the Creator with His creation. Later on, as you crank on into those uh, first 11 chapters, you, f- you find just kind of like, boom, it stands out like a, a massive mountain peak in the, uh, the flat prairies of the West. You, you see the statement that Enoch walked with God, I think it says for 300 years, or after he was 300 years old, he walked with God. And he walked with God, and he walked with God. And apparently the walk with God got closer and closer and more and more meaningful. And the scripture says, and Enoch was no more, for God took him. And then we, we read about Noah. Move to the next book of the Pentateuch, and you, you find in chapter 3 of Exodus, you find God calling to Abraham. And he said, Abraham... I am the Lord of, uh, I'm sorry, calling, he called Moses. And he said, I am the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your fathers. He said, I have seen what is happening to your, to your people, to my people. And Moses, I'm getting ready to do something about it. I want you to go and lead the Hebrew people out so they can be my people. I had never really under, I had never, it never really dawned on me that God was the one that initiated the covenant with the Hebrew people. A creator, God, the king, the one who, who normally would demand that people first bow down to him. He approached the Hebrew people and said, I want to be your God. Will you be my people? All of that is to say God is interested in a relationship in a dialogue, in, in a fellowship, in a walk with men and women, boys and girls. All of you have probably read the statement that I'm going to read here from Henry Nouwen because it's taken from page 70 of the Jesus Creed. Henry Nouwen said, I am, I'm beginning now to see how radically the character of my spiritual journey will change. When I, am no long, when I no longer think of God as hiding out and making it difficult as possible for me to find Him, but instead, God is one who is looking for me while I am doing the hiding. Can we begin, as we peep through the window of the wall, trying to understand this teaching that God wants the church to embrace, can we understand that there is a God who loves His creation and He's, wanting to, he's reaching out and calling for us to walk with Him? Walk with Him. If you need some more understanding about that, just ask Dr. Oswalt. Dr. Oswalt, is the, the idea of me, the, the metaphor of walking Is that a valid metaphor in Scripture to tell about what God is wanting to do with us? Just raise that question with him and see if he can give you an answer. Here's our prayer. Holy Spirit, come in your cleansing power. Holy Spirit, come in your cleansing power to enable me to have real and maturing relationship with you, O blessed Trinity. Could I invite you to pray that together? We pray it collectively as, as part of the body that he, he has redeemed and He's calling into a walking and a daily relationship with Him. Holy Spirit, come in your cleansing power. 
Enable me to have real and maturing relationship. O blessed Trinity. A fourth characteristic. Let's call it connected. God wants His people to be connected. Not just relational with the Father, relational with God, but He wants us to be connected with with the other Christians, the other, the other people. Individualism. When we come into a life of holiness, and when holiness, as we peep through the little window and we're trying to understand, when we really begin to see what it's all about, it's calling for us to abandon our individualism and step forward in wholesome community. In fact, there's the sentence. Individualism gives way to wholesome community. Can I invite you to get off of your, your uh, horse and take off your Marlboro Man hat for just a moment and let's read this sentence. Individualism gives way to... Here we go. Individualism gives way to wholesome community. You know, we Americans really struggle with this whole thing of, of community and, and being together. We struggle with it in a way that you wouldn't if you go to, to, uh, to Haiti or to West Africa or to India Some of the places I've had the privilege of visiting, it just, I remember one time being in Nigeria and and one of our former students who had gone back to to his country was talking about about his brother. Well, I I didn't really know that he had a brother. And he spoke very fondly of his brother. And when I began to quiz him and puzzle it out, I discovered really he was his cousin. And it, it was, he wasn't telling me a lie. He wasn't misleading me. He was simply reflecting this whole cultural dynamic of community. And that's what God is wanting to create, a spiritual community where, where our individualism is not the, the, the radical, cutting-edge kind of, of harsh dynamic in our relationship, but there's, there's an openness and a, a willingness to come and draw I think this was most significantly impacted on me in, I think it was in May of um, 2002. Dan Burnett, was that the, were, you all were living in Oxford, England in 2002. On that, I, I, I was returning from Africa through England, coming home. I stopped at the Burnett's home, spent the night. On that trip, I had a book with me. I was reading a chapter in there. The chapter was simply titled The Trinity. The chapter was written by Callistus Ware, who at that time was a a Greek Orthodox scholar in Oxford. And this is what he says. The doctrine of the Trinity is a way of of affirming that this self-love applies not just to us humans, but also to God. And although it an immeasurable higher level. Since God in His perfection infinitely transcends our human ideas of love and personhood, God, so the doctrine of the Trinity is telling us, is not just self-loving, but He is shared love. God is not a single person loving Himself alone. Now I'm reading these paragraphs flying over the North Atlantic. Trying to stay awake. No, I wasn't trying to stay awake. This had engaged my mind and it was engaging my spirit. God is a triunity of persons loving each other. And in that shared love, the persons are totally one without thereby losing their personal identity. In the phrase of St. John of Damascus, the three are, quote, United, yet not confused. Distinct, not, yet not divided, end quote. God is not just personal, but He's interpersonal. He's not just a unit, but He's a union. God is social or dialogic. There is with Him a timeless dialogue. Are, are, have you put on your... your uh, your oxygen mask and diving down deep into these are some deep thoughts. Here's some more of them. From all 
eternity. The first person addresses the second. Thou art my beloved son. From all eternity, the second replies to the father. Abba, father. Abba, father. For all eternity. From all eternity, the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and rests upon the Son, sets the seal upon this interchange of love. This is God. This is the God who called Abraham, who created Adam, who, who walked with Enoch, who, in whose eyes Noah found grace. Such, then, is the primary meaning of the mystery of the Trinity so far as it can be grasped by the human mind and expressed in human language. God as love is self-giving, sharing, solidarity, reciprocity, response. If that is indeed what the doctrine of the Trinity affirms, then surely it is very far from being a merely technical topic of interest only to specialists. On the contrary, for all of us, It involves in a direct and literal way matters of life and death. God himself is a community. And he has opened the floodgates. And through the blood of his son, he's inviting us to be connected to him. And so when we are baptized in faith, and when the Holy Spirit comes in his cleansing power, he enables our individualism to take second place. And we can begin to connect with others in that divine love that John Wesley talks about. Can our prayer be, would you like to join me in a prayer? Let's pray it this way. Father, connect me by your Holy Spirit of love to those other members of your body with whom I can grow and serve and thus reflect more truly your holy character. Characteristic five. Uh, I'm finding that that holiness is others-oriented. A holy lifestyle enables meaningful service to the needy. Can you say that with me? A holy lifestyle enables meaningful service to the needy. We can think of the the story of the Good Samaritan walking along the road, the, the priest. You know what he did? Sure you know. Walking along the, the priest, the, uh, uh, the road, the Levi. You know what he did? Sure you know. Walking along the road was, or maybe riding along on his donkey, was the man from Samaria the outcast, the socially thrown away as far as the Jews were concerned. And you know what he did. You know the rest of the story. Jesus was telling that, that um, parable in answer to the question, well, who is my, the, the Methodist and the Wesleyan tradition who have been very much committed to social action? And the first one on the list was Phoebe Palmer a great Methodist woman of the 1800s who served along with her husband in New York City, serving the poor, uplifting and trying to to, uh, resolve the the conditions of the downtrodden. He spoke of William Booth. Or we could talk about um, others in in that whole lineup. At Wesley Chapel and Wesley Biblical Seminary, we have an opportunity right across Northside Drive, the Hope House is soon coming online as a way of serving the, the sick in our in our state, and there will be opportunities for us as individuals to do a test to see if our if our holy lifestyle will enable us to actually serve those that are poor, those that are needy, those that are hungry, those that are hurting. Oh God, I want to be an agent of change in my world. Give me grace and wisdom to focus on those, focus on serving those around me. Would you like to pray that together? Oh God, I want to be an agent of change. 
Give me grace and wisdom to focus on those, to focus on serving those around me. And then finally, holiness is transdenominational. It's one of those 18 cylinder words that you sometimes want to put a hyphen in. And it means to go across denominational lines, it means to uh, break out of, out of the. Uh, my granddaughter's little description Sunday morning when the church was nearly full, Pastor Ron, she was, had her little fingers like this, and she broke it. She said, Papa, here's the church, and there's the steeple. You open the door, and there are all of the people. You know, it's time for us to break out of the church and take this message beyond just Wesley Chapel. The disciples came to Jesus with a complaint they were complaining. They said, Jesus, there's some people up and down the land that are teaching you. They're, 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 they're proclaiming your, your, your truths and your, your teaching, but they don't belong to the twelve. Please tell them to stop. And Jesus said, time out. Other sheep I have that are not of this flock, if they're not scattering people abroad, then you leave them alone because they're doing good in the kingdom. I will forever remember, President Smith, when you and I and two or three other folks stood in the, uh, the office of the, the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartolomeo II, I think was his name, a few years ago. And he, here's, this, here's this man with, with all of the, the regality of, of uh, ecclesial history behind him, He's the, the spiritual head of the Eastern Orthodox section or sector of Christianity. And he's the head of a church that typically, historically, and for centuries has taught and believed that they were the only true church and there was no one else that was Christian. Do you remember how puzzled it seemed that he was? As we stood there, we had that interview for about an hour. We had, we had come to say, we want to express gratitude to you for having a church that produced theologians many centuries ago who influenced John Wesley to a life of holiness. Who, John Wesley who gave birth to a movement that is making impact on our world. And we want to say thank you for having theologians in your church. Maybe I was using my imagination, but it seemed to me he was, his, he, the cogs were spinning in his head and in his heart thinking, what? I can't throw these guys out. They seem warm-hearted. There seems to be a kindred spirit here. What do I do with them? They're, they're Protestants, for all, for, as some would say, for crying out loud. I've never really understood what that means other than crying out loud. They're from America. They're not a part of our Eastern tradition. And I have to leave it with him in terms of his own conclusions. What I've concluded is that the message we teach cuts across all denominations. Would God waste a prayer? Uh, would he? Do you think God would waste a prayer? Especially if he prayed the prayer? He prayed a prayer. He said, Father, I pray that they would be one. Not W-O-N, but O-N-E. One in you and me as you and I are one. Who was he praying for? He tells us, I'm praying for these 12 and I'm praying for all of those who believe on my name because uh, having heard of my name from these. He's praying for everyone. I'm coming more and more to believe that this is a teaching that that needs to break outside the holiness ghetto, as as, uh, I think I first heard Ron use that term a few years ago. I'm not sure where it came from, but breaking out of the holiness ghetto. Let let this truth permeate and impregnate the whole of God's world, the whole of the church. I think that's what he is calling us to be about. O Christ of God, forgive me for being sectarian and empower me to begin thinking and acting transdenominational as I live the life of holiness 
in my world. It's not been many months ago that the leader of the evangelical world stepped aside with public confession of his personal sexual sins. I've heard from a couple of different places that very recently one of the prominent Christian musical artists of our day has recently announced a sinful lifestyle. I some time ago was impressed when I first heard the chorus, Holiness, that's what we need, holiness, that's what I long for. And I learned that chorus in a non-holiness, non-Wesleyan assembly. With the stuff that is happening in our economy, can we afford to continue to stand at the wall and stare through the hole? Let's not do that. Let's start dismantling the wall. Okay? Can we do that? Dismantle the wall. Dismantle the wall and let that doctrine out of its entombment. And let's begin to take it to the streets and take it to the world. And let's, let's let it go beyond where we are so that the evangelical church can find out that you don't have to live a life of spiritual bankruptcy. You can live a life that is godly and victorious so that the people who look at you with surprise, as one did, we were on a break at an at a, at a orchestra concert, and he asked me one time, what do you believe? Well, the main thing, we believe that we can be conformed, transformed into the image of God. And just with startle, he looked and said, do you really believe that? Let's take that message wherever we go and not be ashamed that he's called us. Paul said, I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. I I count everything as loss, as garbage. I'm going to put it on a big heap pile of trash, and I've embraced Christ. That's what holiness is about. Can I invite you to begin to tear down the wall, and let's let that doctrine into our life and into our thinking and ask the Holy Spirit to come and empower us to be victorious Christians in our world? Amen? Father, we say thank you. Thank you so very much for your truth that comes to us and guides us and teaches us. And I pray that you'll let your Holy Spirit empower us for victorious Christian living in a world that is, in in many ways, seems like it's going upside down. But we're glad, O God, that you will walk with us in very special and precious ways. So to you we give praise and honor and glory in the name of Christ. Amen.